Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Voice of the Canter. We are on number three in the programmes list of the season, and the ECA invites you to hear from various different leaders in the community. of the role of the everyday role of the canter. We are going to look at various different topics and today's topic is, past today is Hirsch Kapstern who hails from Liverpool. His father was at Grove Street Shul and was an expert in Nusakha Tefillah laning and also a shoker. He was a cut above the rest as they say. Welcome, Hirsch. Okay, thank you, Alex. Before I introduce the panelists, let me just say a short word about the European Cantors Association, for those of you who aren't very familiar with it. So the European Cantors Association uh, is an independent body which aims to ensure that the music of Jewish prayer continues for future generations. Um, we endorse, we're endorsed by many distinguished cantors and rabbis all over the world and we try and embrace best practice wherever it exists. We are uh, welcoming participation across the spectrum of Jewish worship, and we want everybody who is involved in the synagogue, rabbis, on officers, cantors, uh, anybody who is you know, in, interested in synagogue and synagogue policies and synagogue music to recognize the beneficial role of the cantor. Um, we run a scholarship scheme for the trainee of cantors, and we'll come back to that when we talk about Natan. Uh, and we also have cantors conventions, typically every year, not this year with the pandemic, uh, which are fully kosher and um, run on orthodox lines. We have an academic wing also, which organizes international conferences on the music of Jewish prayer in association with departments of music of universities across the world. So that's just a few words about the European Cantors Association. So the way tonight's session is going to go, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists in turn, and I will ask them in turn some questions about their background and their role, interest in, in cantorial music, chazanot, and so on. Having, uh, so our three panelists today, so we've got Cantor Minister Albi Chait of Leeds United, Leeds United Hebrew congregation, not on the football team. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Cantor Nathan Fagelman of Liverpool Allerton Synagogue and Rabbi Meir Schindler of my very own Richmond Synagogue. I will tell you more about each of them before I ask them their first question. So having introduced the participant, the, the panelists to you, and you learn a little bit about them, uh, we'll have a discussion on the specific topic. So the panelists will be answering questions. Having done that, um, we'll invite you, the audience, to ask, to ask questions also. Now, you're very welcome to put questions into the chat in advance, and we'll pick those up when we get to the, to the audience question time. But please don't use it for chit chat or comments because otherwise I won't be able to see your questions. Okay, so uh, and when we get there, I'll invite you to unmute and put your question directly. Okay, so now let me introduce you to our first panelist, who is Rabbi Cantor Nathan Fagelman. Really? Rabbi Fagelman, Cantor Fagelman, was born in Israel, but grew up in Manchester. And I think I, I first met him in the context of an organization called the Philharmonic, which was a precursor of the ECA, uh, which ran a competition for cantors or aspiring cantors. And this was in 2009. And as a result of that, Natam was awarded a scholarship to study at the Tel Aviv Cantorial Institute under Naftali Hirschdick. So that was really Natam's great introduction to cantorial. Well, he'll tell you more, but that's my understanding was a great introduction to being a chazan. But he is now rabbi and chazan. Well, he was a rabbi and chazan, first of all, in Sale, and now in my hometown, Allerton, uh, Allerton Synagogue in Liverpool. 
He's married to Avital and has three children. Not anymore. That's that, that out today. Ah, how <laughs> many have you got now? Up to five, thank God. Five! Muscle tough, muscle tough. Two muscle okay. tough. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start by asking you a few questions. So, what's your, Natan, what's your first memory of Chazanut? This is going to be a bit unusual because I didn't grow up in a shul with a Chazan. The first time I came across Chazanus was um, a friend of mine's Bermitzvah. His name was uh, Zave Saunders. His father, Rabbi Saunders, was the rabbi at the High Crumpsall Shul, which was, of course, the shul of Chazan Avram Hillman. And when it came to benching, I heard this very strange noise that I wasn't familiar with. And it was a Chazan giving a, a, a recital of, of, of benching, Berkat Amazon, that uh, quite threw me <laughs> um, and initiated. Uh, he had a very, very powerful voice in those days. Um, and that was my introduction. And I have to say, didn't didn't make a great impression. Didn't, didn't, didn't really understand uh, what it was. The the next, uh, if you like, time I came across it was there was a, 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 a concert advertised at the Bridgewater Hall. I imagine Alex was probably behind this, uh, but I didn't know him in those days. Um, and it was supposed to be Naftali Hirschstick with the Great Synagogue Choir. And when we got there, we found it was I think Naftali pulled out, and the Moshe Hashel had stood in for him. Um, and I really enjoyed that. Um, then I, my grandfather, who'd moved to, Man moved to Manchester from London at that time, had a big collection of tapes. Most people on this call remember what tapes were. Um, I showed them to my children, they wouldn't know what they are. Um, and I started borrowing tapes of uh, yeah, the classics, the Kosovitskis, the Rosenblatts, and uh, various more, more recent ones, um, the, the Monovanis and Watsons, I can't remember. Uh, and that really uh, brought me into it. Um, and that's how I started developing a an enjoyment for, for Chazanus. Okay. Well, I already mentioned that you were trained in the Tel Aviv Cantorian Institute. Have you had training elsewhere as well? So the, the Chazanus conventions I've been to have all been very helpful. Um, you know, even just a few days, but very, very intense. The, uh, Don't uh, I know it? You know, <laughs> you know, you know yourself. Um, you know, it's an opportunity to learn from, I've had many great Chazanim uh, at, the, at the conferences. Um, and uh, it's a relatively small group, so you get, get sort of personal attention. Um, and that's been helpful. And, and vocally, you know, I've been to uh, some good teachers. I had a very good teacher who passed away. It's called Jeff Lawton, uh, lived in Middleton. And he was sort of more or less retired when I knew him, and he just sort of enjoyed. I'd be there about two hours, and he'd just say, oh, 30 quid. <laughs> so he, was, um, he just enjoyed teaching. So, so I was very lucky in that way to, for voice, voice production. Yeah. Okay, so tell me, um, when did you decide to be a Chazan first and a rabbi later? Um, sort of. Um, so, yeah, in my early 20s, my, my Rosh Hashiva at the time was uh, Rabbi Yomi Moskowitz, whose father was a Chazan in London, in Munks, Chazan Moskowitz, if anyone remembers him. Um, he was, he was, you know, enjoyed it and he sort of encouraged me. I used to, my yeshiva, luckily, was only about a five minute walk from the Great Synagogue of Jerusalem. So, it was very easy for me to go Shabbos morning, Friday nights when I could, um, to, to listen and, you know, just, just you sort of imbibe it and, and absorb it um, from, of course, was some time of Natalie Hirschstick, who later became my teacher, as you said. So, so that was uh, a great opportunity. And then, yeah, so, so that developed from there. Uh, to be a rabbi, I sort of had a choice to go and study something like law or to become a rabbi. And... Um, I decided, yeah, I decided to become a rabbi and a chazan. So there's quite a tradition in Anglo Jewry of what we call the cowboy Nick, you know, someone who does everything, you know, people like obviously Albi's father, of course, um, Lionel Rosenfeld, you know, it's, it's quite a tradition. Um, even Diane Apfel, for example, was a chazan, and it was, it was quite a well known uh, tradition, especially in the provinces. So I felt that was where my, where, where my skills were, were, were going to be best used. Okay. So, and, and does, the, does this work well, the, the amalgamation, having both roles? Does it work well for you? Generally, it does. Um, firstly, you can control the time of the service. You know, some chazanim tell me, you know, the rabbi spoke for 20 minutes and he didn't start Musaf till 10 to 1, and then it's therefore when you finish late. Whereas this way, you can, you, you, you can decide if you want to sing Ati Yotzata, how long your sermon's going to be. So you have, it does bring you that sense. Um, yeah, I've only really known this way, so um, there's always, you know, 
you don't have the the dynamic of the rabbi and you know not getting on with the chazan which can be challenging so so for me for me it works also it creates less pressure on you to sing um you know the role of the chazan as a pure chazan has been very uh, challenged in recent times even the best chazan were losing their positions for various reasons so when you when you're the rabbi you don't you don't feel that it's you know your job only to sing so it, it creates a sense of freedom about it that, that i like mm. yeah. Okay, before we move off you, um, tell us a little bit about your community. Um, I know Allerton, but not many people on the call will. Right, right. Well, firstly, it's lovely to see so many Allerton faces. I've got some of my executive on, so I'm going to say nice things. Um, um, yeah, no, we're a really, really lovely community. We're about um, 200 plus families, so it's sort of a medium sized provincial community. Um, I think we're now the biggest in Liverpool in terms of members. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we could say traditional provincial community. So um, people want things done properly in shul. They want, you know, a high standard. Um, but, you know, personal observances is, is a range from, from Shema Shabbos to those who uh, you very, almost, almost never see. But uh, everyone's embraced in the community. No one's judged. Everyone's welcome. A very friendly, warm, welcoming community. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to turn to Rabbi Schindler now. So, Rabbi Schindler, you and I know each other quite well, but not everybody else knows you. Um, and I should tell everybody that you're not a chazan and you don't have aspirations, I don't think, but you can tell me differently in a moment if you wish, and you don't have aspirations to be such. But I can also say you're a beautiful bald fila and knows your nusach beautifully, very well. So, uh, you're serving a good part of the role of the Chazan, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so um, do you have good memories of listening to Chazanim and Chazanut? It, it, it's quite a funny thing because, I say, I, I, you know, I didn't grow up loving, you know, Chazanut. That wasn't, um, wasn't ever an aspiration. I, I will say um, I, that, I, you know, I went to, to Shul regularly. My father's a rabbi. And he is, is, you know, was, was well known, at least in the Chazanut world, as being a conductor of the London Jewish Mail Choir um, and, and other things. And he obviously did a bit of Chazanut himself. And, and that kind of a, through osmosis, just by being in shul, hearing all of his nigunim, um, was one major element in terms of my personal knowledge of, of Chazanut in the early days. Uh, the other person, uh, perhaps less well known is actually my, my mother's father, um, the Reverend Abraham Brish, who had a, a yeah, I mean, he really had a powerful voice. Um, for those who, you know, were lucky to hear him, I still have some cassettes of him, of him singing. And he really was um, quite a chazan. And um, whilst I didn't have the opportunity to, um, to hear him so much, because he has already retired by the time I was born, um, but nevertheless, um, through my mother, a lot of his tunes came came down. So, and my father adopted a lot of his tunes as well. So that was that, that was quite an yeah, quite an amazing thing. In terms of Chazanut, the first time I can remember really hearing, um, getting involved in Chazanut, besides for the uh, the tapes that my father would play at home, which I have to say weren't necessarily always. Um, you know, we were much more interested in those days in hearing the more modern Jewish music and and everything else that was going on. Um, was being taken to one of the choral midnight selichot services, which my father was the conductor of the choir. And I, the first one I ever recall was, to, I believe it was in Hampstead Garden suburb with the great Chazan um, Chaim Adler. And that was really something to behold. That really kind of blew you away. Um, I, I, I think since then, I've always had a, a like for Chazanut pieces rather than Chazanut as a general, uh, as, as you rightly put in your introduction, I see myself more as a balta filler, uh, a nice balta filler who tries to inspire through music, but not necessarily through chazanut in whichever uh, other way there is. So I kind of pick and choose the chazanut pieces that I like um, and kind of disregard the rest. I know that sounds, in, in the presence of all these other chazanim here, that's, uh, that's kind of outrageous, but that's the way it is with me. Okay. Um, you have a degree in engineering, as I recall. And um, perhaps you were set on a path to become an engineer. Um, when did you decide to become a rabbi and why? Well, let's be honest. I mean, people are much more beautiful to deal with than robots. 
So I, I was a kind of robotics engineer. I, I, if, I'm, if I'm completely honest, I, rem I still have this very strong recollection um, while I was in the sixth form at school and I was, uh, we would, I was studying Bukhavuta with my Havuta in, in my class and my teacher came over to me. He heard me trying to explain a concept to uh, my Havuta and, um, and he, said, he said to me, you'll be a very good teacher one day. And to be, and if I'm honest, at that point, I already had thoughts that I wanted to become a teacher. I didn't know in which area. Went to yeshiva um, for a few years in Israel. And at the end of that, I had a major dilemma. Do I continue with my studies knowing that that's probably what I want to do? Or do I um, fall back on the safer option of, of going through the university route, maybe having a uh, you know, more, more normal job, as they might say. Um, and that's what I did. And I, after going through engineering, which was probably the creative, it kind of, um, I guess it spoke to my creative side. Um, and then, uh, and afterwards, uh, with a, a small stint with the government, I realized that actually the, the area that I enjoyed most was presenting training courses to others. So I said, oh, forget all this. Um, I'm going, I'm going to go, go back to Israel and I'm going to uh, go to train to be a, to rabbi, be a rabbi, going to do simicha, et cetera. And, uh, I guess that's really where, where, it was, where it was from there. And while I was out there, I think three and a half or four years into my SMIC program, as, as it was coming to a close, um, I was brought over on an internship for the United Synagogue and never looked back since. Wonderful. Sorry, you, you've now done what I should have done, which is introduce you properly, giving a bit of your <laughs> background. And we should add to that, that you've been rabbi now in Richmond Synagogue for five years. And... and one of the things that you've done, which has nothing to do with Passover and the pandemic, but um, which has been wonderful innovation for us in South London, where we are rather starved uh, for Jewish community. Uh, you founded the Richmond Jewish Community Hub, which is a social, cultural and educational centre for Jews in Southwest London. So not just for our shul, but for all the synagogues in the South, in the Southwest. So um, you're very welcome in our community, I can tell you. Okay. Uh, so I, I won't miss out saying a few words about you, Alby. Superstar that you are in all the newspapers. Well, in the JC, but in, in full regalia anyway. So um, Alby also has a Liverpool connection, born in Liverpool from a, um, a family who was a cantor. His father was a cantor. Uh, and uh, you also got into a, being a coming cantor very early in a, in a synagogue that was very close to where I lived, Greenback Drive, uh, after your father was ill. So at a very early age, I mean, who would believe that you became a cantor at 14 in the synagogue? Perhaps you'll tell us a little bit more about that in a moment. And since 2006, you've been formally cantor, a grown-up cantor, shall we say, and latterly the minister of the United Hebrew Congregation in Leeds, which I am told is one of the largest and fastest growing congregations outside of London. And now you're a regular contributor to BBC television, national radio, and you've performed around the world. Um, I should have said, we didn't, we didn't add Rabbi Shin. I, see if I, I think I can get your family right. I know you've got one wife and four children. <laughs> Albie, perhaps I'll get yours wrong. Uh, but I believe you're married to Gila and you've got three children. Is that correct? Yes, correct. All right. So you started being a cantor at 14. Uh, you obviously a son of a cantor, so you had knowledge and experience from very early on. But what is your first memory of Chazanot? you have a first uh, memory? First of all, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Hirsch, Alex, Russell, Geraldine, Barbara, you do an incredible job and everybody else involved with uh, the ECN. It's such a pleasure to be with you this evening, so thank you for having me. Um, really, to begin, I think when you're the son of a cantor, the grandson of a, of a, of a Khazan, I think you have no choice <laughs> but to follow in the family tradition. And it's, it's like the, the air that you breathe and the milk that you have as a child, it's just ingrained within you uh, and part of you right from the beginning, uh, from day one. So if you were to ask me, Hirsch, what is my first memory of Chazanot? It's a hard one to answer because I didn't know life without Chazanot. Um, it is something that is 
within my heart and in my soul and part of my entire being. And, you know, Natan mentioned uh, a little while ago about tapes. Um, I remember Real to Real. Who remembers Real to Real? And, and even now in my, in my parents' house in, in Liverpool, all the Real to Real tapes are still there. Nobody has a Real to Real player. But they're still there. They're still there. Somebody will one day uh, put them back on and, and play them the way they should be played. But it is, it is everything. It's part of me. It's all I've known. Um, and, and, you know, dare I say, it's something really unheard of that um, nowadays somebody should begin this art at, uh, or have the opportunity to lead uh, this art, uh, as I have had from such a young age. So to be 14 years old and be given the reins, um, and I say that with, with gratitude and thanksgiving to those that allow me to have those opportunities, um, to lead services with full choir. Uh, and there's a number of Liverpool people here this evening because I'm, I'm from a shul that, are, that was hugely rich with cantorial music. I'm very lucky not to have had it, not very lucky to not just have had it in the home, but to have been part of a synagogue from, from the beginning that, that carried Jewish music as, as a huge, um, huge part of the, of the synagogue. You know, today you've got to search for these things and, and it's hard to find synagogues that carry it as, as, as sacred as, as uh, certainly my upbringing. Did you, have you had any formal training other than through the osmosis and your father and your family? Uh, yes. Um, however, my greatest teacher um, has, is, and will always be my father. Taught me everything, everything um, that I know. And it's not just the cantorial music, and maybe we'll touch on this in a little bit, um, but it's not just how to lead a service, but also by osmosis and by example how to lead a congregation and that is very very important it's not just the service it's the congregation um and that's not just from the bimmer that's outside the synagogue also um but I, i've had the amazing opportunity over the years to work with people like some of these names you'll you'll recognize or may not keith mills phil wilcox uh when i lived in israel I studied one-to-one -one with Michal Shamir, one of the greatest privileges of my entire life, one of the greatest opera singers to grace, uh, to come out of the, the state of Israel. Um, and I worked with her, you know, worked with her uh, personally, which was just an unbelievable privilege. Um, and also, and there I take the opportunity of thanking the ECA for the, the scholarship that they gave me for a few months uh, when I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical. I studied with Naftali Hirschdick and of course, Raymond Goldstein and, and somebody who I worked with for just a little while that made a lasting impression um, was somebody called Chaim Feifel of Blessed Memory. Um, and he worked with him for a, for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months or so. But it's amazing what an impression somebody can have on you in such a short space of time. So I'm very blessed to have worked with some of the most incredible people in the cantorial world, in the classical world, um, and who have played a massive part in, 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 in what I do today. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I should ask you this question the other way around to the others. Did you ever have a time when you thought you might not be a chazan and do something else? When you're asking a third generation uh, person is such a question, <laughs> it's a very difficult. It, it, it was like destiny. It was just the way it was always going to be. And I toyed with the idea of, of taking my place at university. Um, but it, it, this was always the way it was meant to be. And, 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 and um, probably many of you this evening know, uh, know my father. And uh, sadly, when he became unwell, very, very, very young um, and went from a very, very sought after, extremely well respected, still well respected um, cantor in the, in the cantorial world. Um, I think part of my drive is to ensure that his le his legacy always um, continues and it is never forgotten. I see myself as simply a, a, a continued, continued uh, mouthpiece, dare I say, for his incredible art. Um, and, and that is uh, a, a hugely important to me that he, his name is, is, is never forgotten. Wonderful. Okay, um, I should ask you to say a little bit about your shul, about um, the, your community. Tell us a little bit uh, about I'm, I am so blessed, so blessed to be part of a synagogue that has also had a huge 
rich history in cantorial music and we are very very lucky to be perhaps one of the only synagogues left today and, and uh, very difficult to put a number on such a thing to have a full male choir how many synagogues today have uh, a, a proper full uh, traditional choir who up until the pandemic were performing at uh, all simchas and all, all occasions you know for, for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Shabbat Mevarachim, uh, singing traditional music, contemporary music, um, with an amazing uh, uh, choir master, Phil Kammerman, who many of you uh, will, will have heard of. We're so blessed to have that tradition in our synagogue and, and to be part of a synagogue uh, that is one of the largest synagogues outside of London. But we are very proud to have uh, the opportunity to share our music with people. We, 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 it's, it's, it's hugely important. For me, the service should be inclusive. It should be engaging. It should be enjoyable. It should be uh, spiritually uplifting. And, it, and it's, it's something that we have worked, and I say we as a congregation have worked on for many, many years, uh, approaching 15 years with my congregation. Um, uh, I, they, they gave a 19-year-old boy a chance to, to become their full-time chazan, which I, uh, I did in 2006. And we've grown together hugely. Um, and it is, it is massive. It's it, music and, and, and cantorial music is, is very, very important. And it's something we, we maintain. I'm very proud to be, um, to be part of a synagogue that really still flies the flag of, of cantorial music. Okay, thank you. Right, well, having had a few words from each of our panelists, I'd now like to turn to the topic of the day. And we've talked, called the topic Passover in Pandemic. And really, we're going to focus on the pandemic rather than on Passover. Um, we, we are, of course, in Passover, so it's true. And it has some special connotations, but mostly we want to talk about how the synagogue, how the com communities, have been affected by the pandemic and how you have steered your communities through this, which has obviously been a big challenge, challenge for everybody, but a challenge particularly for you. So let me start with Rabbi Schindler. So what would you say was the first change you made to respond to the pandemic? And how did you, deci how did you decide to do it? Well, this is a, uh, quite a strong memory of this because um, it all kind of blew up, I believe it was March time last year. And we, uh, first of all, it was so, quite close to Pesach, uh, quite close to Passover. And myself and my wife um, got COVID quite early. Um, luckily, we were, we, you know, we had recovered within about a week of Pesach. So we had a quick, um, you know, quick clean around um, and made sure we were ready. Um, but what I particularly remember was that at that point in time, you know, that was not the time of innovation. That was a time of ensuring that the people who were most vulnerable, the people who were in need, need uh, got what they needed, particularly in time for Pesach. So the the largest, um, I remember the very the, the first thing that we instituted just, just as soon as the pandemic became real uh, was um, in trying to first to do a phone around just simply do a phone around among all the elderly and the vulnerable people of the community. What is it they need? What are they lacking? Are they getting supplies that they need? Uh, and what are they going to be doing for Pesach? And we'd arranged with uh, the local Chabad house um, that, that people could put their orders with them and we would organize um, drivers, um, people who would, who would then go and deliver all the packages that, that one needed. Now, because I was actually out of, a little bit out of, um, um, you know, out of action for a little during that period of time. So we had, uh, we had to rely on others, and particularly um, our care team were, were amazing at, at that time. But I certainly certainly made uh, made the time to make quite a number of the phone calls uh, myself. I, I, the reason why I remember it so vividly is because when when eventually myself, my wife came out, and we were yeah, we were yeah, two we were two weeks in isolation, and we came came out of isolation. By that point, all of the restrictions, all of the lockdown had taking place. I remember just going, walking on the streets of Richmond and thinking, what has happened here? You know, people are queuing outside of Waitrose and Tesco's. With, and, and because we'd been, we'd been out of it for two weeks, we just, no clue what, what was going on. That was a massive um, uh, thing. So, it, so the, up until Pesach, it was more about ensuring that everybody um, had what they needed for Pesach. 
post Pesach, then we were able to to like be able to breathe and think about well, how can we take this going forward? Okay, thank you, Natan. Um, what about you? What was your first real activity? Yes, yeah, so I think on the same lines. I mean, because you know Liverpool's a small community, uh, you know. So as a rabbi, I'm also involved in things like the, the cashless provision and um, the areas. So it was very much firefighting. People were very uh, nervous, and, and 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 you know we did we set up teams, and we still we still keep up with people, call round, um, and that you know seems to, seems people definitely seem to be a lot calmer now. But um, a lot of people had planned to go away for Pesach. Uh, especially older people, hotels, family, people coming to them or, or, or going to. Um, so, so there was a lot of panic. People weren't sure. There was sh shortages of, of, of supplies that people were worried about. Uh, the shop couldn't quite cope with the demand that it hadn't planned for. Um, we you know, were ma made about 60 Seder packs for people in the community who didn't have. And I remember having to queue half an hour at Tesco. The problem was also you could only buy three things in a go. So, you know, three packs of cabbage for Morris. So I had to do about 10. And I was at the time was learning quite a lot of Mishnahis for people who passed away, in particular about Kofnas of Liverpool and other people. So I was standing there learning Mishnahis on my phone, queuing half an hour, I mean, every day and going back for more apples and lettuce <laughs> than the next day. Um, so it was a very unusual and, and strange time. Um, in terms of Shul itself, we moved it, you know, moved online. That was a novelty. Um, I had once used, used Zoom for a, a student chaplain at the chaplaincy conference, um, but uh, that was uh, the idea of doing it every day was, was very novel. Um, and we have managed to keep a, a Zoom, um, you know, shachris going in, in, uh, every day uh, in the community and Friday night and obviously other, other times and events like, you know, um, speakers and quizzes and concerts. That's been very, very helpful. Um, yeah, so those are the, the early memories, just trying to connect with everyone and uh, ensure everything, you know, firefighting, that everyone was okay. I suppose when you say Friday night, you mean pre-Friday night. Pre, 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 yeah, pre, pre Shabbos Friday. Yes. Okay. So yeah. we deliberately invited three Orthodox cantors to this session mm -hmm. because we know that the challenge for working in the pandemic without the ability to have services online during Shabbat uh, is greatest for the Orthodox rabbis and uh, Orthodox cantors. So um, we we're pleased to have you in particular. Albi, what about you? Um, what would you say your first experience or first things that you did um, to cope with the pandemic? You know, it, it, I've, I've been asked a similar sort of uh, question a number of times over the last few months. And I think from my perspective as the chaplain for the NHS for the uh, big hospitals here in Yorkshire um, we were very aware of what was going on early I remember being called in in late January early February time to be fit tested um, for masks and PPE and to prepare uh, I remember having a, a, a small conference with the other chaplains and, and, and members of the uh, of the NHS team uh, to really prepare us so I was I'm not going to say we were ahead of the game, and, and of course not, but this was, this was real earlier than perhaps it was in the general public. Um, I remember going to COVID ward very, very early on uh, for the first few people that, that, were, that were brought in uh, to the hospitals. And you could feel that this was something that people didn't know how to deal with. I mean, everybody will tell you that right at the beginning, it was, it was you know, People were going as we were going along. We were, we, were, we were doing our best. People, the doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals were doing everything they could as time went on and learning every single day. And you could feel that in the hospital setting. So we were very aware of something big that was happening. Um, I do remember the first, the first, I think it was a Monday night that the chief rabbi announced that the synagogues were closing. And I remember writing an email and uh, uh, social media uh, to our congregation that we were closing very difficult thing to, to have to do and i've said a number of times you know when have we ever had a situation even in the depths of this world when people couldn't pray together um which was you know hugely strange to have to tell our congregation that we were closing but i remember that that, that monday evening deciding to pray to daven uh, shachwit online that next morning and the funny thing is i, I think that was my intention that following morning as 
not at the beginning of a process of online offerings, but to simply show people that we were going to continue no matter what. It was more about, for me, right at the beginning, that we were not stopping. We were simply finding another way. And then everything seemed to snowball from then on. And as uh, Rabbi Schindler has mentioned and Rabbi uh, Fagelman has mentioned, many, many, many synagogues, all synagogues, then found novel ways, unique ways, creative ways, different ways to engage with their congregation in, in a variety of ways that's still going on to this very day. And, you know, this is something that we may touch on or we may not touch on, but the new normal will be a hybrid of real and virtual offerings. And I think that's not going anywhere. So it's, it's I do remember right at the beginning, and it's, it's amazing to see what has developed uh, since then. Thank you. Um, we'll come to the new normal a little bit later because I'd like to discuss that in, you know, with all three of you. But before we, before we do that, let me, let me ask you, um, to picking up on that one, to what extent are you following central guidance? Are you, are you getting any guidance that is useful to you or are you doing everything yourself? You're working everything out from yourself? Are you asking me, Hirsch? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah. You and then we'll go to the other two. Um, the chief rabbi's office have been incredible, and I think every single person uh, here this evening and every member of the uh, of, of Anglo jury will 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 commend the chief rabbi's office for the huge support that they have given to every single congregation, whether it be uh, telephone calls, advice, support in in every way, and and. Of course, we use that central guidance from the Chief Rabbi's office as we um, begin to open uh, our doors in different ways, of course. Um, so that, that there is that central guidance that exists, but of course it's, it's important to bespoke um, for different buildings, different, different organizations, different needs, different places. Um, but we do our best and then we'll continue, of course, to do our best for the congregation. Thank you. Natan, how about you? Do you get good guidance from outside, do you think? Or, or do you have yeah, to... I mean, yourself? I think, like I, like I just said, the Chief Rabbi's guidance has been very, very helpful. Um, and in a sense, not following it, it, it seems like reinventing the wheel for no good purpose. You know, we have, we're very blessed to have a chief rabbi and, and, and he's, he's following expertise, medical expertise. So we do, we do stay very much uh, within it. But, but that also within, sometimes the guidance has been um, open. So there was a time in the, in the most recent lockdown where, where schools were allowed to be open, but we, we decided that um, it was in our, in, our, in our congregation not to be open. So... Um, it's not always been absolutely prescriptive. It does depend on the size of the buildings. For example, the other main shul, um, that's, you know, Childwall has a very large building. So it, it, it's lots of events, for example, have been done there rather than in Allerton just due to the, the realities of space. So, um, so we, do, we, do, we do look at the guidance, take it very seriously and, and generally work with it. Rabbi Schindler? What do you say? Um, I know you've made some some decisions yourself, but do you feel the guidance has helped you? As it, no, so the, I, yeah, I should say that the vast majority of of the decisions have been well. Sorry, the guidance I should say has been from the chief rabbi's office and has been phenomenal and very regular and up to date, um, changing all the time. And one of, but again, allowing. I think this is one of, one of the most beautiful things about it. It was actually empowering for rabbis as opposed to uh, disempowering. So it gave rabbis the individual decision to decide, you know, whether they felt that these could be implemented in the correct way for their community, whether that was safe, listen to the, the voices of their own congregation, you know, see whether, whether a minyan was feasible, not, not feasible, how, do, you know, did people feel safe, etc. And I, I, I personally found that quite quite empowering. It, it, you know, the, the, it wasn't uh, prescriptive. It wasn't uh, imposed. But rather, here's, this is this is the guidance. You have to follow government guidance. That, that's no question. But in terms of decision of exactly how you implement it, exactly in your synagogue was very much um, was down to us. And I thought thought that was was, was and, and just the way uh, I was very blessed in, in our particular shul um, that. Pretty much all the honorary officers were pretty much singing from the same singing from the same hymn sheet with regards 
we wanted to keep the, the shul open as much as possible um, within, but, but retaining the trust of the congregation as well. So, you know, not to wait to the very last minute to close it because, uh, you, again, you get a feel from people's sense that, this, that they don't feel it's the right fit to be open at this stage, but then that's the right, it's the right time to close it. So it's, um, yeah, if it, but whatever came out of the chief rabbi's office was invaluable. Okay, thank you. Natan, let me turn to you for a moment. Um, you've all made huge innovation in, in how to work with the community in this period. What would you, what, what's the innovation that you've made that you're most proud of or that you feel has worked best that you've introduced? I think there's two, two areas really. Firstly, um, enhanced use of social media. So for example, I send out a video now with the you know Shabbat email with the Dvar Torah, so that's the people not coming to shul, uh, keeping them in the loop. And um, you know I've called a number of people through the pandemic who say, oh I enjoy I enjoy watching or reading. Uh, for Pesach I got my children to do a little bit of uh, uh, one did Manish Tana and the Dvar Torah. So it just just keeps people. Um, it's another way of, of keeping people together. So you know just just enhanced enhanced uh, personal connections uh, as well through social media. And, and the old fashioned phone call, which is very, very, very important. The other thing we have done to help celebrate uh, festivals, I mean, Tobin, we've had uh, packs delivered to individual members. So for Purim, we had like a little Purim gift, for Hanukkah, Hanukkah gift, just uh, something that, that just helps people realize, you know, a bit like I always said before, you know, we're still celebrating this just because we're not in shul doesn't mean that the whole thing is not happening. You know, Hanukkah is happening at home. You know, we've done uh, restaurant meal deliveries and uh, say gift packs and just that way of reaching out to people in the home. Fundamentally, we are, much as we love shul, uh, Yiddishkeit is Judaism is something to, that's really expressed most at home. Um, and all, all sorts of research shows, you know, the future, uh, you know, people who have stayed with the religion is based on what they, it's very much based on what they saw at home. So, you know, when you deliver that pack to somebody, you know, talk to them at the door, even for a couple of minutes, you know, that creates, creates a, very, a very good connection. Um, so, so it's uh, the, the reaching out of, of sort of, if you like, you know, breaking, breaking new, new ground. That's, I think, an innovation that, that's really been useful. Okay. Rabbi Schindler, how about you? What are you pleased, most pleased with that you've introduced or, or changed? So... You know, obviously, the 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 you know the immediate um, the, the immediate plan was to transport as much as uh, possible that we were doing in the synagogue online. Um, in terms of specifics, um, I would just like to share share a few because there's just a few different areas. Some are very are are ridiculously simple and some much more complex. Um, but I I think over time, what we've realised over the past year is that there's been a major paradigm shift in how community works. So it used to be the whole, uh, you know, the whole goal um, of Shul was very much to try and bring the community, uh, so bring, um, bring people into the community. So, you know, we put on a big event and many people would, would come in uh, and enjoy part of that community and, and come as part of the Shul. And I think what the pandemic has shown is, is what we, it's kind of flipped in the opposite direction. That the, the Shul, the synagogue's role has been to transport the community into people's homes, to them. Um, so there's a few, um, a few things uh, I want to show. What one has got next to me, because it's very close to my heart. You, you labelled this uh, talk passive in pandemic. So this is one that's very recent. After, last, after the first Pesach, which I think came to people a bit more of as a shock, and we weren't overly prepared for it, I, thought, I felt, you know, we kind of had to... Um, you know, make up for it this Passover. And I, I had a real fear that because whilst last Passover was the Passover of shock, this Passover was very much the Passover of being fed up. People were fed up of the pandemic. They weren't fed up of Matza, they were fed up of the pandemic and not being able to spend, you know, Seder with the families, etc. And I had a real concern that a lot of people, particularly those who are living alone or uh, just the two of them, etc., won't even bother opening up a Haggadah this year. Some people maybe eat a bit of matzo, drink a bit of wine, do something, you know, token, but not really go through the Haggadah properly. So, so I came up with this, and um, I'll just show you a little copy of it, so you can see it backwards. Um, 
but this is um, Escape from Egypt. And uh, this was quite many hours in the planning. Um, if I had any sense, I'd have started planning it from Hanukkah, but it wasn't to be. Um, but it's a, essentially, it's an escape room. Uh, and, and, it, and it takes you, uh, and my, my goal was to try and create an escape room, which didn't just have random puzzles, but were, people were able, needed the Haggadah to be able to answer some of the puzzles. And that the theme of the story um, within, the, within the escape room was very much in tandem with Chayv Adam Lirot et Atzvo Ki'iru Yatsu Mitzrayim, that people should see themselves as if they came out of Egypt. Uh, and it was very much in the theme of the Haggadah. So, it took a lot of planning, a lot of very uh, early morning um, sessions, should we say, to try and make sure all the puzzles worked out. Of course, we had lots of um, constrictions. It, it couldn't involve any malacha, things that people couldn't do on, on, on Yom Tov. Um, had to be relatively flat. Uh, and so the way it works is that the, it, when you answer the, the uh, resolve a riddle to one of the puzzles, you get a number and that takes you to the relevant next page that you have to turn to. And now all kinds of different things that come with different, different um, you know, different uh, props and things like that, puzzle pieces uh, that you need to use throughout the So that, that was something that was big. We're still waiting more feedback from, from people to Durham from this year. Um, but that was something that I felt was, was a way that we could perhaps bring, say, uh, bring Pesach to people's homes rather than trying to bring them into the, into the synagogue. So that, that was um, one uh, uh, thing that's quite close to my heart. Another thing which I think is just very simple um, was um, in terms of bereavement. And um, I don't know if this is going to be a discussion at some point in terms of how that's affected and, and online um, versions of bereavement, but there's no doubt that there is a restrained, a restricted amount of um, time that the rabbi, the minister, can really spend with the family. We can't, you know, can't go into people's houses and sit down, have a chat with them as, as normal, um, and certainly can't go into their shiva houses. Um, and so uh, I decided that what we're going to do almost is in a little bit in compensation for the families um, is to put out a form, a Google form to the community um, to give people in the community the opportunity to write their memories of the deceased. And then at the end of the shiva, I would compile it all and put it together with a nicely bound booklet and hand it to the family. Um, I think they, people really appreciate it. It was just a way of, of being able to kind of offset perhaps the, the fact that the people that avail him, the mourners, weren't having a shiva, weren't having that kind of um, friendship and support, at least in a physical way as perhaps they did in the past. And the third one, I don't know if it was the greatest um, innovation in the world, but it was so simple and it really enhanced our services, I think, uh, which is simply, we, we, we found sponsors to put individual whiskey uh, uh, bottles on people's seats uh, for when they came in uh, with a shot glass. And at the end of a, um, again, whether this was strictly allowed, but we, we deemed that it was suitable for our shawl, um, we had little chaim, everyone sat in their seats at the end. And because shawl bec became very functional, you know, it, you know, it was literally, you walked in, you had the service masked, everyone sitting separate and walked out. It, it didn't, it just added a certain element of, not that people would come for the whiskey, but it just added a certain, uh, like a memory of what synagogue is like in, in real life. And, and I think that was uh, something very beautiful as well. It yes, didn't, didn't quite replace the Friday night kiddish, but still, it's good. Albie, how about you? What do you feel have uh, been the innovation or innovations that you're most pleased about? First of all, it's such a pleasure to listen to Rabbi Fagan and Rabbi Schindler because it really makes me process perhaps all the last year that perhaps we forget or um, just to see how congregations, how creative congregations were, all congregations over the last year. You know, Hirsch, I, I love people. I really love being around people and talking to people and sharing Judaism with people and synagogue with people and it's perhaps for me personally been one of the most difficult things um, over the last year not sharing my love and my style of service with with people however things as everybody knows went online very quickly um, but we were able to find people or engage with people in in a, in a way that had never been done before and I, I, I've said previously that uh, and Nathan touched upon it before, you know, Judaism in a communal sense was exclusive 
to the shul and to the school. We could never get any, you know, beyond that realm um, unless it was on special occasions. You know, we were, we were in the shul and we were in the school and that was our way of reaching out to people. Um, but the pandemic gave us the opportunity to get into people's homes in a way that, that was non-judgmental, in a way that wasn't intrusive, and in a way that, that they were actually accessing, can I say, us. So that they were making the first, the first move. And that's amazing. We were in their home and they were making the move, the move to, to, to join us. That's unique and probably will, will change the, the access of Judaism potentially for, for forever. You know, I look back on, on one evening of, of Hanukkah where we lit the candles um, from a place. We, we did it every night in different places. And on one evening of Hanukkah, we had 12,000 devices joining us for the candle lighting. This is not paid viewers. This is not paid advertising. This is organic, you know, device. This is, this is, we didn't do anything to push people to come. 12,000 devices that potentially could be 15 to 20,000 people were watching us light Hanukkah candles. And I remember coming home and telling my wife that Judaism has changed forever. And, and I know that sounds like a crazy thing to say, but for something so simple, people were engaging and, and, and staying with us. And, and it, it gave us the opportunity, not just for Hanukkah, but over the last year, to share with people the most beautiful parts of our faith. And the irony is we were able to share, and Rabbi Shindler and Rabbi Fagan, I'm sure will agree, able to share aspects of Judaism that perhaps were for many congregation, for many of the congregation, a little less well known. We were able to share with people some of the most beautiful parts of our faith. And, and Rabbi Shindler mentioned uh, Shiva House. The innovation of online Shiva House has given mourners, albeit but you know, remote and they're not with loved ones a great sense of comfort that people around the world are now able to engage. People around the world who would never have been able to get offer support. And I know it's remote and it's not the same, but you know, when somebody is, is, is in their raw moment and they see hundreds of people across the world taking the time on an evening to be in a Zoom and sit there for two hours and wait for their opportunity to say a few words. And Rob, I shouldn't have said something that, that, that we've done in a similar way. You know, when somebody sends an email and it's sent to the family of their memories and their thoughts uh, and their words of comfort when somebody passes away, this is not a story that's forgotten in a week or two or a month. This is something that people look back on in a year or two years or five years or on a yacht site and look at that book that Rabbi Shinda spoke about and look about the emails that we sent around and reflect and reread and get a source of comfort for a long while you know, there's nothing more beautiful than reading a story about a loved one suddenly departed and, and having that as a memento that somebody can keep for a long time. So, you know, we're, we're really beginning to touch upon the new normal, but some of these things were done in a way. In fact, I remember one of the most uh, uh, lovely nights that, that we had in the last year, we had bingo one night in the shul. We had so many people join us for bingo. And I spent so long re redoing the numbers so it was applicable from a Yiddish perspective, you know, some of the really funny numbers, whatever. It was amazing. We had so much fun. And, you know, there so, there's so many synagogues who, if they were to put on a bingo night pre-pandemic, it would be one of those sorts of events that you would be begging people to attend and hoping or having to bribe them with food or with a meal. We had so much fun with kids and young families. It was just easy. And, and you know, if... It, I finish, I finish this section with this, if I may. There's so many things that if we were to put on pre-pandemic for people to come out to shore on a seven o'clock on a wintry, wet uh, uh, February night, you'd get 12, 13, 14. But things have become easier, and therefore more accessible, and dare I say more enjoyable than how many are we still here this evening? 69 devices here this evening when maybe pre-pandemic, we would not in many spheres be able to engage that many people so it's such a wonderful thing that has come out of the pandemic you're right you're right um natan we've we've both rabbi shinlan and albi have touched on um, the leviah and the you know, people dying and how it's how it's affected and how it's changed things 
Um, how is how are you and your synagogue coped with this? Yeah, I mean, the, the good news is it's actually the uh, the numbers of people that passed away here in Liverpool. You know, we don't say touch wood; we say <laughs> something else. Beyond horror, um, has actually been uh, has actually been less than in a normal year. Um, that's an interesting statistic. Uh, so many older people have been extremely careful, um, but that does not, not to say we haven't had sadly uh, levias. Um, of course, we had uh, Zoom shivers um, where 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 the families wanted them. It was interesting to see interesting to see different families responded differently. Sometimes people just wanted a very personal space. Um, sometimes uh, people wanted you know wanted to zoom, wanted it to be out there if you like in the public. Um, uh, yeah, so there's also been, you know, it's not been static. There's been times where you could, for example, do things in gardens, like in last summer where things were um, significantly, uh, you know, uh, lessened in terms of uh, restrictions. So, so we've just really gone with the flow of doing as much as we could at, at the time um, of, 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 you know, of restriction, how much restriction we, we were facing. Um, it's been, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people didn't get that sense of closure that you get from the real shiver, um, you know, uh, and that sense of support of, you know, they, they talk in, in uh, talk about a ministry of presence, you know, just sometimes the rabbi being there or people being there is, is a support. It's not so much about what you say, it's just about, you know, that, 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 that support you get from being around other human beings, knowing that they're there because they care about you is just a huge a huge, I think, emotional support for people. And I think that that's really been the hardest part of, of non-personal uh, shivers, not, not feeling that, that sense of support, that sound of conversation, the smell of tea and biscuits, <laughs> the, um, that, that people, you know, that's really what, what gets people through hard times. Um, but where possible, we, we, just, we just support as, pe as according to the way people want to be supported and um, as much as we can. Okay. So let me turn to Rabbi Schindler. Um, what of the things that you've introduced or taken place during the pandemic would you like to keep? What are the changes that you want, want to see continue? So I think as, uh, as Alvi mentioned before, um, he's absolutely right. There are certain things that we can pretty much replicate yeah, without the social element, perhaps, you know, we have to acknowledge the fact that on Zoom, there isn't the same social element. It could be a lot of fun, but the interaction is, is, is tricky. Um, but nevertheless, you know, you, if you give a shear, you, you give a Torah class. Um, if I did it in the synagogue, so a certain amount of people I know will, will make the effort to come out on an evening. Um, would they come out if it's pouring with rain? Weather's not so great. Yeah, and, and yet um, what we found is certainly when it came, comes to um, talks, anything educational, all of that kind of stuff, um, the numbers are greater. Because uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's just so much easier for people. Um, so I think we realized that there's, there's something that can be used there. Um, when things get back to normal, whatever normal will look like, and we have to understand, of course, that it will, it will, go, it will come in stages, it's not going to come in, in one go, um, that, that there will be a little bit of a balance of both of these. Um, that yes, there, there is going to be a need for in-person um, interaction, certainly when it comes to social events, um, but equally so, um, have e either the opportunity for people who may be further afield to tune into that event um, you know, via Zoom or some other form of uh, online activity, uh, that may be an option that goes forward. The jury is really out because there's always a concern that, you know, if, if you're sitting in the comfort of your couch and you have the choice between, you know, just tuning in in the moment from your home or making the effort to get in your car or whatever it is um, and to drive 15 minutes to the synagogue uh, to come to a particular event, that you'll take the easy route, even though you know it's not going to be as enjoyable that way. Uh, but people tend to go for what's easy rather than necessarily what's best. Um, and I think particularly where this is where, where this is a, a major um, concern for me is when it comes to religious services, because at the moment we have Kabbalat Shabbat um, before 
uh, before Shabbat comes in, we do a Havdalah after, afterwards. And it's interesting to see the people who've been coming because we ha most of the people who attend our online services are not necessarily are the people who have been regulars um, physically coming into Shul on a Friday night. So it's interesting, the people who would normally come have been shying away from the online service a little bit. I think because they can feel the difference. And particularly, you know, there are certain uh, events, fun, uh, which can be conveyed um, to a certain extent online. But prayer is, there's something heart to heart about it, where if you're not in the room, it's a little bit more of a show and you're a little bit more distant from it. Uh, I think people feel that very much um, when it comes to even Friday nights, so even if they're hearing all the tunes that they would normally hear, yeah, obviously they can't necessarily join in, so you don't have the, you know, th that happening. But I think in particular when it's, it is on Zoom, uh, I, I know um, as a, as a Balta filler doing something over Zoom, I have to try and pretend almost in my head as if the congregation is around me. I much prefer, rather than doing the tefillah from home, doing it in the synagogue, because that way at least I can somehow have a picture in my head that there are people around me and um, they, want, they want to hear a tefillah. They don't want to hear me singing. I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily blessed with a, with a, with a chazan's voice like some others. And even, even chazanim, I think, would, would, would agree with me that ultimately what really connects people is not just the music itself, it's the power and what, those mu what that music means as well, certainly when it comes to tefillah. Um, and, and, you know, what we don't want to do is to, is to give people, um, to encourage people to only take that kind of back seat over Zoom rather than, uh, rather than come online. But nevertheless, there will be that we have found that there are people who hadn't been coming to services anyhow. And for them, it's definitely beneficial to have an online service uh, prior to Shabbat or after Shabbat than not at all. Um, so that's a dilemma which I haven't completely resolved yet. Mm. Natan, how, how do you feel about this? And do, do you, are you, are you doing an online service like Kabbalah Shabbat and have to learn so on? And, and do you get the same people or do you get different people? Um, it's interesting. We we do we do pre Shabbat. We do every morning. We do uh, uh, we've done a couple of havdalas, not not regular. Um, it's interesting. Of, of, if we took took the morning minion regulars, um, I'd say about half of them came onto Zoom. Um, about you know it's a split. Some of them just said no, it's not for me. Uh, it could be something like Grandma Mayor just said you know they 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 know the real thing. But then we did get some new faces. Uh, people who, who didn't come to shul, or, or especially Friday night. Uh, sometimes that's a practical thing because maybe they live too, they live further away, um, or especially the older people that you know it's too much for them to to, to come. Um, so, so we have seen some some new faces. Um, numbers on Zoom have gone up and down, <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's not been a static um, thing. Um, I've often wondered if it's Zoom fatigue, and then you find. You do an event which is very well attended, so I'm, I'm not yet worked out the sort of the formula of why why people come on off Zoom so much. Um, I think I may just said there's a we, we don't really know yet. I mean, we just had our first um, this evening. We had our, our first sort of in-person event. We did a, a, a communal barbecue where we had everyone in individual like gazebos and, and people booked in, uh, and we did it in sessions. And I saw there was a very, there was a good demand for that among the younger people. Um, we have quite a number of families there, uh, but older people, not as many. Um, I think a lot of them are still nervous. So I think some people are just going to have to get reused to um, mixing and the, the mind around going out again. It's also very much a personality thing. Some people like socializing and some people don't particularly like socializing. Uh, you're introverts, you're extroverts. Uh, personality is a big part. Um, you know, you know, so it, it, there's certain there's certain events that you know going forward are very like a speech, for example, is very easy to to zoom because if it's based on you know it's listening to somebody or even even music that can be streamed through Zoom if it's uh, but if it's sort of like your uh, you know like a supper quiz, it doesn't really it's about it's about the being there, you know it's it, it's not so much that's really the point of the occasion, you know no one's gonna get any 
prices are going to remember in 10 years time it, it, it's coming together so so for events that you want to come together for you know zoom is not is not a good medium for events that you you know can join in gain something from to listening education for example often that is a good medium so so it's 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 definitely going to be you know a mixture uh, i think we're going to have to work out you know what events are off for zoom and what events just just are for, for in person um and, and, and work and we're all going to be learning as we go along basically yeah. albie how about how about you do you do you see that um you'll be carrying forward some of the things that you've been doing during this period uh, i think it was it was slightly different for us um first of all i, I Throughout the pandemic, the president of our synagogue, vice president and myself, we worked so closely together to navigate our way through through the last 12 months. And it's been um, such a pleasure working with them. And, and it's given us the opportunity to think and to plan and to assess constantly on what is, is not and how we should adapt things. But to touch upon something that, that uh, Robert Schindler and Robert Fagel mentioned, we didn't do our, we did not do our, what I'd call our services, our religious um, events on Zoom. We did them on Facebook. And, and I say that uh, on purpose because I personally think that they are suited better to Facebook. And, and let me explain why for just a, just a moment. Mm -hmm. I, I think when you're on Zoom, and, and we've been used to Zoom now for a while, and every community is different, of course. So, so I'm, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I know that people are conscious of whether they are their cameras are on, conscious of whether their cameras are off, conscious how long their cameras are on, or conscious how long their cameras are off. I'm also very conscious that some people feel that if they're in the Zoom, how long they have to stay on for, and if they leave, people see that they leave, and therefore they feel like they have to stay. Some people put themselves on mute and take off their cameras and people think they're there. And as a result, they <laughs> go off and do other things. There's a lot of psychological commitment that goes with Zoom um, that for some services that take longer than others or for some certain things, it, it can carry a, a challenge and a half. And I found right from day one that I'd pr I preferred Facebook that meant you came on when you came on and you left when you left and there was no... In, there was no necessity for you to be seen or to be part or to have engaged. You know, whenever we all go onto on Zoom, we all we all do this. We swipe across. Who's there? Who's there? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's just people are actually less engaged with things on Zoom because they're more worried about the social element of who is, isn't, what they're looking like, what they're wearing. Oh, nice hat. Oh, no, whatever. <laughs> I wanted people to focus in on what we were doing, not the fact that we were gathering. And I know that sounds crazy because we were trying to keep together. But on certain things, when it came to religious things, like Havdalah and Friday night and every morning and Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, for me, it, uh, I prefer and we still prefer and we, we continue to do things on Facebook. Um, and we'll continue to do this on Facebook. I have to tell you that even until uh, recently, uh, when I say recently, because of personal circumstances, um, we were getting every single morning nearly nearly 500 people every single day to Shachris. Wow. Every that's single deep. day. Now, that's not all live. That's people who watch it a little bit later. There were people who would tell me, well, they'd watch it at nine o'clock in Davin with. That's people from this side of the world to that side of the world and everyone in between. That's the beauty of Facebook. You can reach far more people in a less uh, intrusive manner uh, and people can feel more comfortable. Um, and that's an incredible thing. We found and we continue to find new congregation from all over. I always remember early on in the pandemic, somebody who lives quite away from our community who found us and said, Albi, you've brought this new sense of religion to my life. Don't take this away from me. Somebody who found religion during the pandemic and it was now saying, don't take this away from me now. You've given me something new. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. And, 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 it, and it's not going to go anywhere. And we've all said it's, it's, there's going to be a hybrid. There's going to be a mixture of events together, not together, remote, what, what belongs. And we will all navigate what's right for our communities. I, I will we'll finish this, this question by saying this, that in the last year, I think congregations have 
perhaps seen the value of a traditional chazan and seen the value of wonderful music and beautiful music and, and, and creative music um, and adaptive music, inclusive uh, services. Um, and, and what we tried to do was to show how good music, how good Jewish music, how good cantorial music can be during this time how different it can be. You know, there's, there's one of our choir members who is on here this evening, and I'm not going to mention who he is, um, Stuart Weinberg, um, <laughs> who has for years said to me, um, you know, how we need to continue to evolve the music. And, and, and that's been a discussion with cantors for many, many years. And we tried to show how we can evolve the music over the last year. And he continues to send me from time to time new ideas. and all. We, we've, we've not changed it, but we have try to make it even more eclectic by taking the modern, the traditional, the cantorial, the contemporary um, and share it with people and people have enjoyed it. And that has given us the license to continue into the future. And it, and it excites me um, of where we can take this and, and how the role of a cantor can be huge in a community uh, for, for, for many years. Great, thank you. It sounds from what you've all three of you have been saying that the future is going to be a hybrid future future is going to be one where we will have traditional to fill out in shul um, where uh, you'll be singing you'll be davening together but at the same time you'll be continuing to use the facebook or zoom to reach people who otherwise perhaps you wouldn't be able to reach and who will appreciate that is that, is that right so that's that's more or less the message um if, any of the three of you would like to add anything about how you see the future, how you see the new normal, I'd be very pleased to hear from you. Rabbi Shilin, do you want to say anything, anything else about that, how you see the future? The way that the, the shul is set out in terms of the services and the concept of minyan, all, all of that ha has to remain. There's, there are always going to be a few concerns and this is, will very much be between um, different communities and each community will have to work it out. Um, I mean, I know, for example, um, where um, I mean, in our community, we, we uh, for example, Dublin Friday night, always at seven o'clock. Doesn't matter, winter, summer, it's always at seven o'clock. That's, that's, that's what works for people. Um, which meant that when I was doing a Zoom during the winter time, the Zoom was considerably earlier, of course, because it had to be before Shabbat came in. And um, that meant that whilst um, you know, in the past, the, uh, the rabbi had to focus on one minyan, you know, one Friday night service, uh, one Dvar Torah, or whatever it happened to be. Um, it suddenly um, made Friday a very different type of day. Um, and we're going to have to work it out with our families and, and, how, and how that was going to work. Um, so in terms of the practicalities of it, each individual um, will, will work it out. Um, as I said, in t uh, I mentioned before, um, what the concern will, of every synagogue is always going to be is, if, if we offer an online service, is that going to detract? Is that, is that going to discourage people from, from attending? That's, you know, will be remain to be seen. Uh, and I think every community will have to take their own decision on that. Um, and whilst I, com I do completely agree um, with Hazan Chait about the, the role of music um, and in terms of, uh, you know, when I, when I on, on a regular Shabbat, I turn up that morning, I haven't usually decided what tunes I'm going to, I'm going to do, usually not. And often it's read by the mood, the people, uh, sometimes it's of course the time of year, it could be my own personal mood, mood and my own personal fantasies. And, um, Obviously, something like that, it can't completely be read, read on Zoom. So in Zoom or, or Facebook, whatever happens to be, does become a little bit more concert-like. And, and that's, that's why we can't, um, you know, whilst it is there as an option, and it's very important for those people who would otherwise not be engaged at all in services, somehow we have to, that has to be conveyed that this is not also really the genuine article either. Um, and that's a balance that I don't have the, the complete answer to, but just wanted to raise right. that thought. Right. Natan, do you want to add anything? Um, the future? Yeah, yeah. Just, just focusing, there's been, there's been some comment about um, 
about the, the, the tefillah, about prayer itself. Uh, the biggest challenge, I, I think, um, you know, that the, we all face as rabbis, chazonim, um, anyone really involved in shul life, is that essentially we're now dealing with a generation um, of people to whom the traditional prayers really don't mean anything. The vast, vast majority of the people coming to our shuls can't understand what, don't, they don't have Hebrew as a language, so they don't understand what's being said. The older generation who were coming um, and, and hopefully will come back, they, they don't necessarily understand, but they have a feel of what shul is and they have a, a connection to the music, the, the tunes. So when they sing, whether they get the words right, they get the word wrong, but they know that, you know, it's... But they can join in. They, 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 know, they know what they're singing. They, know, they, they don't know what it means. You know, it means something good. They're supposed to do it and 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 enjoy doing it. The, the the reality is that shul for the next generation wasn't wasn't actually working. So we really have a much much bigger challenge in 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 across our communities, and is that how we're going to make shul a space that works for the below fifties, you know, the ones who haven't been coming to shul regularly in their youth, may, might not have attended to. Uh, since seven mitzvah, so so, COVID has given us really an, it's like an op- a fresh opportunity to, to try and rethink the shul services. And I've given this a lot of thought. The challenges are that if we want to have traditional services, as uh, Rabbi Shino just said, you know, the, the real thing, the, the real thing. If we if we look at a Shabbat morning service, so till Sheikh and Ad, most people aren't there. They're not going to understand. The bits they understand are the bits. Are, are, are the, the, the sermon because that's in their language, the loyal prayers for your family, um, that, that's and those are the bits really that that as we're talking of services getting shortened are the bits that are, are disappearing. So so really we, we have a, a whole new challenge of of how we're going to get people even even most people most people coming that generation can't even read at a reasonable speed certainly not the speed we have So so the challenge is that were already there. You know, I heard a thought that um, someone said all the shifts that were pre-pandemic have just continued, have just, have just been speeded up. So retail was in major decline and then it's just basically tanked. You know, the, the use of social media was on the up and then it's, it's gone, you know, turbo powered. So the, 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 ch- the point was that actually the, the connection to community, to, sh- to, to shul services, to damning, was is virtually is virtually lost amongst uh, amongst amongst the the under the under fifties, and and really the biggest question that we have to think about in in terms of a new normal is is what should a service look like to somebody who doesn't understand and doesn't see why they need to come to shul. Um, even <laughs> I've even had older people say to me things like, "I go to shul uh, to help with the minion." It's okay if there's no meaning because I don't really need to be there. I'm not saying Kaddish. So that means there's no appreciation that there is some type of obligation for an individual, what we call a, a chiyuv, you know, to daven, to pray. There's some type of idea that in the shul there should be prayer for those who like it and want to do it. But um, the real challenges going forward are how are we going to make a shul a relevant space and how are we going to make prayer a language for people who have completely disconnected from it? And that, that's, uh, that for me is, 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 is by far, far, far the greatest, the greatest challenge we face. Hush, if I could just add one more, one more point. Yeah, go on. I, actually, it's really kind of a question to the Chazanik as well, because uh, I think one of the major um, things that people are going to have to get used to is during the pandemic, certainly for those who held, held some services in the synagogue, um, under the gui- guidelines, we've tried to streamline it as much as possible, and we've shortened the service somewhat. And um, part of shortening the services, presumably, again, certainly for Chazanim, is to reduce the amount of Chazanut, the amount of uh, the long, you know, the, those long pieces, long drawn out pieces. Try to streamline it as much as possible. Pick and choose, kind of the, the uh, which parts we are going to elaborate on and sing more, uh, take more time over, and which which parts were not. 
And I think post pandemic, it's always going to be the question. It's going to take people, I think people like the idea of having slightly shorter services. Um, but they also like, they also miss the fact that, um, that Shul is perhaps singing wise, not as participative as it was before. Uh, and it's just an interesting, um, it's an interesting um, kind of a paradox if you like, between those two. I don't know if, if, if the Chazanim here have any wow. comment on that. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, the more Chazanut there is, the longer the service is going to be. Um, but people have found in the pandemic that actually they quite like the idea of shorter services too. So I'm just interested to hear about that. Yeah. Now, do you want to comment on that? I'm delighted to. Um, <laughs> I, 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 listen, I, I think every, every single synagogue is going to need rebuilding in different ways, different synagogues are going to need rebuilding in, in what, what they need to rebuild. But every single synagogue, every single shul in the world is going to have to regenerate and, and restructure certain things that's applicable or appropriate for themselves. You know, I want to touch on something that, that was mentioned before. That the irony is with all these online services, that the service leaders have spent more time preparing them than they would have otherwise. And as a result of that, it's actually made people think differently. What would be a nice song to sing? Not what's going to get us through the service. And as a result, more respect to the application of the service has taken, uh, because people have had to think, well, well, I'm on TV tonight. Then people are watching me. We're going to, it's not the five or six or seven or 10 or 12 or 15 that normally go. I think there's been more respect in the planning of the service um, than perhaps at any other time before, which is a wonderful thing. Um, by the same token, from my perspective, um, I found the under 50s, and I'm only using that term because Natan used it, and if, you get, if I get in trouble, I'm going to send them to him. Um, <laughs> the under 50s have engaged more with us than ever before. And that's an amazing thing. More people have engaged with us than ever before. And, and of course, as the shul becomes more functional, more functional, whether that transitions into synagogue attendance. I said a long time ago, I love people. I love nothing more than being with people. Nothing would make me happier than going back to being with people. But there is still going to be uh, a space, an opportunity to engage with people in a different way. And it's better we give them something different and they're part of it than we simply shut our virtual doors and go back to the way it was. And, and, and if somebody's listening to a Friday night service done in a very different way, but they're engaged, well, then we've achieved, we're achieving something. And, mm -hmm. and you know, Rabbi Shinder himself said before that uh, the irony is the, amount, the, the, the sort of people that are coming regularly to the morning, evening, Kabbalah, Friday night, some of them are not the regulars. That's the, that's the amazing thing. So for, for this idea of shutting our virtual doors and channeling it, in two, five, seven years time, only into the building, I think would be a mistake. There is always now going to be an opportunity to engage people virtually. And yes, the, the concept of synagogue prayer is not online. The process is with a minyan, with, with, in the traditional sense. But people have engaged like they have not before. And we, we need to keep that, that, that channel open. I want to give one, one, one plug for something, if I may. Uh, our choir has not sang together for 15 months um, and we miss it terribly. And we've just finished a video where all of the choristers have recorded at home. Uh, it's taken us a bit of a, I think our choir master's here. So we're, we're releasing it for Yom HaShoah. It's something very, very special. So please, please look out for it. Okay, thank you for that, Albi. Natan, one final word from you. Yeah, yeah. No, interesting, Albi, what, you, what you've just said. I wasn't talking about engaged. So, so in other ways, you're right. The virtual world has engaged uh, younger people in, in, in ways that they hadn't before. But in terms of, 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 of davening, in terms of, of connecting with the davening, um, just, just really wanted to come on to um, what Vashinda uh, said. Um, Albi's right. There has to be more planning. So, you know, we are keeping services short. I knew that first day on to have, the focus, if you like, of that day, of first day Pesach for me, is Tal. So I, I would then work around, making sure there's time to do to give Tal the 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 uh, the the honor, focus. if you like. It's one of the prayers that we have twice a year. Tal and Geshem has its own nusach. It's very uh, it's very emotive. It's very powerful. It's done properly, and effectively work the time 
yeah, I won't sing them Kaimcha, I'll cut back a couple of songs in Halal, and, and making uh, time and space for, for, for that. So, so that is, is, is certainly true. Um, it does take more planning. I, I think in terms of, of, of the future, and this is perhaps where the role of a professional of a chazan will become more necessary, is we, what we have to try and do is get people to have them with us, not so much listening to us. Um, you know, there's certain parts of the service, if you actually think when people engage, it's often when they're saying things with you, when they're doing, you know, um, uh, it's a ditty, it, 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 it's nothing, but, but they're doing something that's making them part of it. And, and, and um, I listened to one of the, the ECA um, things I did with one an American cousin, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I hadn't come across him before, called, um, I think it was Kessler, Jackie Kessler was that his name? Um, and he spoke about, he'd written things where people, where he will do, and, and the cow will join in, and, and that's, those are very powerful things. If they're doing it with you, and that doesn't take more time, and that 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 is really, I think, where we have to try and and, and focus, because then by not taking more time, we're, we're trying to bring people bring people with us. Um, and um, yeah, the question is still open. You know, will there be time or, or interest in in Chazonus pieces as such? But that, I think, was already pre-pandemic. There were very few chazanim who were singing many pieces in shul. But um, the idea of bringing people with you, yeah. we have to adapt the nusach and the tefillah to getting people to be able to do it with you, uh, with us. And that's really a uh, work. Maybe something ECA can take a lead in um, to maybe prepare resources and, and uh, uh, develop the idea of, if I imagine every time the chazan did a, pr- uh, a, a prayer, and the sefardim do this very well, if you listen to the Kaddish, they often just shout out a word, right? If you know uh, what Safari davening. If we did things, you know, uh, you know, and, and people just shouted out core words in the Nusach, in the tunes that we prepared, prepped them, prepared them, in what we call an antiphonal style. Um, that I think is, is really a, a way forward. But um, obviously, this will be time will tell how things develop. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I was going to invite people from the an audience to ask questions, but I haven't had lots of questions in chat uh, and our time has really run out. So really, I'm going to thank our three panelists for sharing their thoughts, their experiences, which have been for me very interesting, I'm sure for you also. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for everybody for listening. Uh, I hope you found it was interesting for you. Um, This is the third in a series of The Voice of the Cantor. In two weeks time, we've got the next session, which is called The Challenge of Modern Orthodoxy. And really its focus is, does the modern orthodox agenda leave room for a conventional cantor? Who should lead the service in the synagogue? Do we need a rabbi? Or must Chazanim become rabbis? So we've we had some taste of this with tonight's panelists in that we've got a mixture of rabbis and cantors and rabbi cantors, every combination almost you could wish for. Uh, and we've been talking on some of this, but we're going to have a different panel. Well, actually, Alby is going to be joining us for this session as well. Is that right, Alby? Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is, I know. Uh, but we've also got Michael Goldstein, president of the United Synagogue. We've got Stephen Lees, who's cantor in the Central Synagogue. We've got um, Rabbi Cantor Danny Bergson from St. Dan's Hebrew Congregation, and Cantor Adam Kaplan from Presswich Hebrew Congregation. I think we'll have a very interesting exploration with them. Uh, I'm sure it will be good. And uh, I have the privilege of being moderator again. So please do join us and invite your friends to come as well. So thank you very much. I would would like to say something because I found this a very, very informative and very interesting session. Uh, Thank you very much for (laughs) taking over the job of the moderator and um, doing a wonderful job. Thank you to all the panelists, most engaging, lots of food for thought, um, especially for me, um, which way to go because every congregation is different. But I think we've learned a lot and it's not an easy job that rabbis and chazanim and ministers have in this um, pandemic that we're all faced with 
It's how we educate those that need to be educated and which step forwards we take to enable them to participate and maybe come back to a different type of service when the pandemic is over. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Pesach. Stay safe and stay well. And um, please God, we'll see you in our next session. Thank you. Thank you, Annie.